Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I was asked to present uh, all the arguments against performing a routine elective uh, central neck dissection. So it's, uh, it's going to be very easy after Eyal kind of uh, brought all the issues and harder after uh, Professor Talmy brought uh, his issues. So this is the only thing that we agree upon, that lymph nodes in this, uh, are very common in papillary thyroid cancer and that the central neck compartment is the most common site involved. And that's where it stops. That's where we have the fact that the rest is not, uh, we are not on very stable ground. The easiest thing is to look at the, uh, uh, at the guidelines. And again, except for the Japanese, all of the other guidelines uh, tell us to consider only in specific uh, patients uh, do a central uh, neck dissection. Now, as head and neck cancer, and if you're a surgeon coming from general surgery that used to do colon surgery and breast surgery, we are very afraid of this uh, lymph node metastasis. But this, but this is not head and neck cancer, this is not squamous cell, this is not melanoma, this is not adenocarcinoma, and these nodes in the neck, papillary thyroid cancer nodes, do not behave as other nodes as been, uh, just been shown. We have a lot of different variety of nodes. We're, we're here to talk about the micrometastasis, these uh, two millimeter um, nodes. Uh, we're not talking about the macro uh, metastasis that we, you can identify on ultrasound or cystic nodes that you sometimes see on lateral necks and not the uh, extra cups or uh, spread. So as for macroscopic nodes, there is evidence that it, it does affect, uh, increase the risk of recurrence, but we don't have the same facts for microscopic uh, nodes. So what we need to do is look at the chances that this node's gonna grow and affect uh, overall survival and distant metastasis and all the other criteria. And luckily, like uh, has been shown by, uh, it started with ITO and then other papers came out. Uh, we have observational uh, studies that by watchful waiting do serial ultrasounds, measure thyroglobulin. We know that the median risk of recurrence for clinically and clinically N0 patient, you do not see any nodes, not on imaging, not on palpation, is about 2%. So most of the patient uh, will not recur if you just observe them. Um, and obviously it's, it's a very uh, indolent disease, so nobody died of disease. And for us, for surgeons, for clinicians, it's very hard to put on our to-do list, do nothing. But that's doing something. Even if you do not uh, operate, that's still doing something for the patient. It's still, you decide to do, uh, to, you choose to do nothing. Um, that's another paper that has been <laughs> discussed here. And we know that even if you have nodes, they, a lot of them do not grow or some of them even disappear. So um, lymph nodes, we know that for young patients, uh, do not affect um, the, the survival. So what's new? What, why are we standing here today and, and talk about it? Probably it's because we have better imaging and we can detect very small, unimportant nodes, whether in the central neck or lateral neck, pre-op or post-operatively, uh, and we have better thyroglobulin assays, so we can now detect these unimportant levels of thyroglobulin, which uh, brings the patients and some of the uh, physicians into very high anxiety, but sometimes they don't mean nothing. So we have to remember how it all started. Um, there are two arguments, arguments that we hear about uh, when we ask why to do a central neck dissection routinely. One is the same answer that um, George Mallory, the first man who climbed Mount Everest, uh, uh, said when I climbed the mountain because it's there. Well, that's not a, a good reason for, for surgeons. Uh, you have to prove benefit, not just because you have nodes. That's not a reason to take them out. And the other reason is it for us, for surgeons, because we can. Well, the patient is on the table. The neck is open. You know where the distal part of the recurrent laryngeal nerves is. Uh, you know where, sometimes, you know where the uh, inferior uh, parathyroid glands are, but that's not good enough reason to take the, uh, the central neck uh, prophylactically. Um, so we have to look on the benefits. And luckily, we had several meta-analyses that were published uh, in the last uh, uh, five years. So they're all based on retrospective data. We have to remember that, but that's on 1,200 patients. And there was no difference in the risk of uh, recurrence in thyroid cancer between the two groups. Um, that's another a more recent uh, publication that showed identical local re regional recurrence with a little bit more surgical morbidity in the immediate post-op. 
Um, that's a very nice paper from uh, the Memorial Group that looks specifically whether the, the central neck dissection uh, done prophylactically, whether it reduces the rates of central neck recurrences, whether it reduces the remote morbidity. If, if, if you have more morbidity, if you do a secondary uh, central neck dissection, um, either just the central neck or with a completion thyroidectomy, do you improve the rates of post-op uh, thyroglobulin? And do you improve the stratification of uh, radioactive iodine based on uh, um, the pathology report of the central neck? And their conclusion was that you do not have, by now, you don't have, uh, to this date, sufficient data to support all of these questions. Um, that's another meta-analysis that uh, looked only on um, tumors larger than one centimeters. So it's not uh, the micro um, carcinomas. And even in this uh, group that has a uh, higher um, T uh, disease, uh, they, sh they showed some kind of a trend toward lower recurrence rate, but the number needed to treat was 31. So you need to operate on 31 patients just to benefit one patient. So that's a more ethical problem, but you have to keep this in mind. As for the thyroglobulin, uh, I mean, you can find different articles uh, uh, trying to find if there's um, a better thyroglobulin levels, uh, but even those articles that showed lower level of thyroglobulins are only in the immediate post-op or several months of the sur after surgery. If you look on um, uh, papers that publish thyroglobulin levels after several years, they remain the same between the two groups, those who did or did not undergo um, prophylactic neck dissection. And the uh, other thing is the um, complications. The first do no harm. So like uh, Professor Talmy uh, said, level six actually starts from the inferior border of the hyoid all the way down. Well, we stop at the, the supersternal notch, but if you do a, a proper level six, you have to go down to level seven along the uh, inamate artery and take all of these nodes because the nodes don't know that there's a manubrium over here. They continue directly to level seven and you have to address specifically those nodes and the paratracheal nodes. And these nodes, uh, um, you know, that's where the recurrent laryngeal nerve is and the parathyroid uh, glands are, the inferior parathyroid glands. So there's a lot of ways to do a um, central neck dissection. And a lot of the papers uh, that publish their reports on central neck dissection, if you look closely, they did an ipsilateral central neck dissection. Obviously, you're going to have less... Uh, hypoparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, you're going to have less uh, nerve injury, so you have to uh, bear this in mind. Um, so I, I just chose one of the papers that showed uh, um, higher rates of complications. This is in the BMJ, and he uh, quoted these articles. And I mean, it, it doesn't make sense if you see a paper that shows you uh, uh, less complications or the same rate of complications if you do a more extensive surgery. It does, just doesn't make sense. Um, like, again, we heard before, most of the surgeries are done by low-volume surgeons. Sometimes they do five or ten thyroidectomies a year. Uh, obviously, if you're going to recommend these surgeons now do a prophylactic neck surgery routinely, you're going to have more complications. That's, um, that's for sure. And the other, th the other issue, if you do a central neck dissection, routinely you're going to have more Notes, you started with uh, CN0, with clinical N0, and you can end up with a positive node, even a micro node, in the central neck. So that uh, upstage or supersized the, the patient to pathologically N1A. And if you're over 45, that upstages you from stage 1 to stage 3. And again, with no be a proven uh, long term benefits looking on studies and the, and the possible harms for the neck. And the other thing is the right iodine. Stage three disease, now we have to think and with micromets, proven micromets, and we knew they were there, but now they're out. You have a pathology report, you have to address it somehow. Now we have to uh, think about uh, giving radioactive iodine. And we know it's not just a pill that you take and nothing happens. It has both immediate and long-term risks, including malignancies, including dysfunction of salivary and lacrimal glands, and overall reduction in quality of life. So you have to bear this in mind also. Um, the chances to uh, get this radioiodine uh, ablation, if you do a central neck dissection, is about two or three times more, I mean, higher uh, rate of uh, getting this uh, radioiodine ablation. So 
will we have an answer in the future? Maybe in 10 years we won't have this discussion. So um, uh, there was a very nice uh, calculation, uh, design and feasibility test by the ATA, and they calculated that you, you're going to need about 6,000 uh, patients for a follow-up for a follow-up of uh, five years, so you need a seven years uh, study. So there's a lot of institutions, um, a lot of patients, a lot of recruitment, and probably we're not going to see this answer in the near future. That's uh, the bottom line. Uh, there was a promise of the BRAF uh, mutation, the most common uh, genetic change in papillary thyroid cancer, that um, you know shows you a lot of um, aggressiveness of the tumor, but. Uh, that's a nice paper that looked at all, on all the papers that uh, uh, try to look if you need a central neck dissection or not if you have the period mutation and you don't have a right answer. So that's not, probably we will have uh, genetic or some molecular uh, answers, but it's not going to be just the period mutation. Um, that's a nice paper that kind of summarizes uh, the stratification rules that we can have. Um, Again, they, they started by first do no harm and as do not do a com when you do a completion thyroidectomy, don't go back and do the central neck dissection. Stop doing that. That's not a reason. I mean, again, it's uh, because it's there and because you can. That doesn't mean you have to do it. But if the patient has a T3, T4, if he's old, older than 45 or he's a kid, if he's a male, if you have bilateral multifocal tumors, if you already have a lateral neck, obviously you have to go to the echelon uh, central neck. Um, and if you got the know-how, if you know how to do this surgery, um, then you can or at least consider doing the central neck dissection. Uh, if, you, if you're going to do a central neck dissection you, um, and the tumor is smaller than one centimeter, an ipsilateral central neck dissection uh, might be enough because all of the nodes are going to be just ipsilateral. A large, larger tumors will have uh, nodes on both sides of the central neck. Uh, so going back to the patients we, start, we started with, so he's, uh, he's 66, more than 45. He's a male. Uh, he has bilateral uh, PTC, which are T2. Uh, so uh, this patient probably, um, again, without evidence, I do not have a prospective uh, randomized trial, uh, but this patient, need to be, we need to discuss it with him, and maybe we'll offer him a uh, a central neck, at least uh, consenting for this uh, procedure. Thank you.